Summit Church, Jamie Veer, your online campus pastor. I am so excited you are with us today. If you're joining us Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., you're a part of the live broadcast. And what that means is that you could hop into the chat right now, drop your name, where you're at, what you're doing, maybe you're eating some candy, oh, it's pretty early, or drinking some coffee, whatever you're doing, we wanna hear from you and we also wanna pray with you. If you have a prayer request, hit, pr uh, hit the pray button and we'll pray with you right now. Okay, Pastor Chris is talking about one in his message series. It's about simplicity, how to simplify your life and go after God. And today he's talking about one person. So let's turn it over to Pastor Chris. Hey, God bless you guys. Welcome to Summit Church. I'm Pastor Chris, lead pastor here. And I wanna thank you for being here at our online campus. I hope you're taking advantage of some very cool features like number one, if you've missed the first two messages of, uh, messages of this series, hop back and watch those. Number two, while you're watching these services during our streaming time at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning, you can be live interacting with other people who are engaging in the online community as well. And that helps us all feel connected. I hope you're taking advantage of that. And give a big shout out. Uh, maybe email them a thanks or do it right there during the online uh, interaction and thank Pastor Jamie, our online campus pastor, and Jared Buer, our technical director, who are just doing an amazing job adding more and more resources and making our online campus better and better. And so speaking of our online campus, we're going to hop right into our online message today. And uh, we are continuing with this message series called One. And the idea of this is that simplicity can be powerful. We get ourselves in to a lot of very complicated and messy seasons of our life and we just think, oh my gosh, if I could just go back to a simpler time, if I could just deal with one thing at a time, if I just could have one day where I get to take a break. One is a powerful, powerful concept. And so we covered some important things in messages one and two and today we're gonna talk about one person, and I'm gonna walk you up to how important it is to connect with just one person. So I don't think it's realistic that Jesus healed every single person that asked him to, or that had a disease, or that came in contact with him, or had an issue with health, but we know he healed some of those people. And I don't think it's realistic to think that Jesus said yes to every invitation to every person who invited him into their homes to have a meal with them. But I do know that Jesus said yes to religious leaders and said yes to sinners, and he ate in some people's homes. And Jesus' whole ministry was to come and seek the, and save the lost, but I don't know that Jesus sat down with every single person who needed to hear the message, the good news of God's mercy and grace and forgiveness and kindness. Jesus was incapable of doing that, but he did it as often as he could with as many people as he could. So you may wonder, okay, what's the point of all that? And here is the point that you and I can be paralyzed by the idea that we live in a very big world with a lot of people, and all of those people have hurts and issues and problems and pain and complaints and all of the things that complicate their lives and all the things that we carry around that complicate our lives. It doesn't seem plausible that we're gonna make an impact on all of that world. Now add to that that it feels very, very difficult, overwhelming actually, the concept and the idea of us being Jesus to them. I don't know about you, but I rarely feel prepared to be Jesus. I mean, we're good at being judgmental and critical of each other and judging each other and weighing the weight of the sins of the other people, but we rarely are good at being Jesus to each other, right? So here's the big question then. In a world that's as big and as messy with all the problems and the issues that go on, with all the unhealthiness and toxicity that happens in the world around us, and with us feeling incapable as being a follower of Christ to represent Jesus well, us being Christians who are still figuring it out, is it possible for us to be Jesus to anyone, much less more than just one? And you might guess the answer is already yes. Of course it is. 
That's not only our calling, it's our purpose. It's why we were created. So here is the pathway to getting there. If we can simplify the idea of being Jesus to the world by simply being Jesus to just one person. Let me say that again. It starts with being Jesus to just one person. Doing the simple things that Jesus did in a moment where Jesus would have been just Jesus. Just one person, one moment, and one opportunity for us to be Jesus. Listen, Andy Stanley said it this way. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And I think that it is an amazing anthem for our lives. And that's where we're going to start. And that's how we're going to start being Jesus to just one person. It's the simplicity of one. So take your notes out. If you don't already have them out, open up your app, follow along. The simplicity of being Jesus starts with choosing, number one, one person to forgive. One person to forgive. So (laughs) I think that if Jesus, or that if anyone had the right to be annoyed and frustrated and impatient and even angry at people with everyone around him, it was Jesus, right? Because Jesus was perfect. He was the son of God. He was without sin. And everyone around him was just full of sin. And I'm talking about the godless sinners who knew nothing about God, nothing about righteousness, nothing about pursuing the heart of God. I'm talking about the religious leaders who thought they were super, super close to God. And I'm talking about his own disciples. Everyone around him was in this perpetual behavior of missing the mark. And that's what sin is. It's missing the mark. It's God created us for this purpose, and we never seem to reach that purpose because we are arrogant and ignorant and sinful and selfish and stingy and insecure and insincere and jealous and self-righteous and misguided and misinformed and abusive and we're otherwise offending God in every imaginable way. We are unrighteous in virtually everything we do. So, Listen, the number of times that Jesus has been sinned against can't even be counted. Yet, 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 listen to what Jesus says to Peter. When Peter asks about being chronically offended by somebody, Matthew 18, 21 through 22 says this, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, when someone won't stop doing wrong to me, how many times must I forgive them? Seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, you must forgive them more than seven times. Jesus said, brace yourself. I'm about to tell you something that's probably going to frustrate and disappoint you. You've got to forgive them more than just seven times. You must continue to forgive them even if they do wrong to you 77 times. And other translations will say 70 times 7 or 7 times 70. Jesus was really just saying innumerable, uncountable, incalculable. You just have to keep forgiving. Now, listen, I know that we break out into a cold sweat because we think we're going to have to do math. Jesus is actually just removing the math from this moment. There's no mathematical equation to work out. Jesus is saying, basically, I'm removing any of these religious or personal or cultural ideas of what makes someone forgivable and what makes them unforgivable or unforgivable. Jesus says, whatever system that you've put up, whatever thing you've put into place where you say, this can be forgiven, this can't be forgiven, or I'll forgive this many times, but I won't forgive that many times. Jesus says you have to erase all of that. You have to remove all of that, and you have to forgive without limits. Jesus himself said this, listen, you have to forgive as generously and as often as God forgives you. The Apostle Paul expands on this concept in Colossians 3.13 when it says this, make allowance for each other's faults. And forgive anyone who offends you, no matter who it is or how they offended you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, 
so you must forgive others. You see how this is becoming like God because this is how God behaves to not just one, but to everyone. So here's my paraphrase of what that says. Stop being surprised or frustrated or disappointed by the idea that people are going to fail you. People are going to offend you. People are going to disappoint you. They're just like you. You have been a disappointment to people, but more importantly, you've been a disappointment to God by missing the mark. God wants something for you. You've chosen something else, and that happens not only in your past, it happens every day. It's a current struggle for you, so you are perpetually offending God. Yet, God makes allowances for that. And that's what we're told to do. Anticipate people's failures and be okay with those failures and disappointments in their life. People have faults. Be okay with that. So that when they do offend you, when they do sin against you, when they do hurt you and sin is hurtful and impact your life, you'll meet them with the same readiness and willingness to forgive them with the same speed and completeness that Christ has met your offenses. Listen to what Paul said again in Ephesians 4.32. Be gentle with one another, sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. So here's how you get to the place of being and forgiving anyone and everyone who sins against you. Start with just forgiving one. Now, for some, you're going to need to start with the person who has offended you most or has hurt you the most deeply. Maybe once you get that done and you fully and completely forgive them, then you can forgive virtually anyone else that sins against you. Or for others, you might have to start with the small offenses. You might have to start with the person at work who annoys you. They're not going out of their way to do it. They're not attacking you. They're just annoying you, and you just release them. You make allowance for their faults. You make room for that, and you just meet them with grace and forgiveness, and you practice that enough with one. You can move on to the next one and practice with that one and so on and so on. Number two is this. The simplicity of being Jesus starts with choosing Number two, one person to serve. So we had a pretty eventful, I'm going to try and keep this story as short as possible. We had a pretty eventful night, Tuesday night. We were kind of going to bed. It was midnight, 1230-ish in the morning. And uh, I think Cole was probably already asleep. Carson, he stays up kind of late like Lisa and I do. And we were laying there drifting off. And and, uh, I think I was maybe turning on the alarm or doing something with my phone. And I had it near me and with my hand on it. And all of a sudden it buzzes and all these alerts start going off and all of the cameras uh, that I have on the front of the house start alerting that there's motion on the driveway, there's motion on the other part of the drive, there's motion at the front door. And I think, oh man, that's usually someone's got to be pretty close to the house for that to happen. So I open up the app and I see a really tall guy standing on our front porch. Now this is 1230 in the morning. And so I'm assuming that he's not there with good intentions. Nobody shows up uh, to drop in and say hello at 1230 in the morning, um, who we know, right? And uh, I don't recognize this guy, and he's got his back to the camera, and he's kind of leaning up against one of the pillars of the front porch. And uh, I watch him for a second, then he turns, he walks towards the front door, he starts banging on the front door. Immediately, I push the siren button on the app, and all the uh, cameras out there have little sirens in them, and the sirens start going off, and this doesn't even phase the guy. You'd think the average person would go, oh, my goodness, uh, they don't want me here. I better go. Didn't even phase him. It's almost like he wasn't listening or didn't care at all, and he kind of meanders back over to the front of the porch, leans against the pole. He's not leaving. So I activate the microphone, and I say, Get off my porch. Sound like the, uh, the old guy in Dennis and Dennis. Get off my porch. Then he turns and he faces the doorbell and he begins to ramble incoherently about why he's on my front porch. And it makes no sense at all. So I realize pretty quickly he's either high or drunk or not mentally healthy. And he keeps talking and he keeps talking. 
and he trying to explain why he's there. And I just say, I've called the police, leave now. He says, okay. And then he goes into another drunken or incoherent diatribe about why he's there and something about paintball and something about something else. And then he looks at the camera and he says, okay, love you guys. And he sort of walks off the porch and he says, I'm going this way. So I, at that point, hadn't called 911. And I thought, well, you know, in order for me not to be a liar and for me to make sure this guy isn't trying to get in, I have some elderly neighbors that live next to me and I want to make sure he's not scaring them or trying to get into their home or I don't know what his intentions are and I don't know how badly disoriented he is. So I do call the police and I'm telling them as much as I can about him. And I said, listen, I was looking through a camera. I can't give you a perfect description. I said, let me see if I can see which way he's going. And I uh, throw on a shirt that doesn't at all match the Hollister uh, 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 sweat shorts I had on. So I was hoping I wouldn't have to encounter anyone. And I walk outside and I'm saying, yeah, I think he had a gray t-shirt on. And right then he pops out from behind my neighbor's enclosure, their porch right there. And I said, oh, he's at my neighbor's house. And they said, okay, we're sending somebody. He hears me talking and he begins to move quickly towards me. My heart begins to, you're loving this story, aren't you? My heart begins to race and I say, stop where you are. Now I have to tell you, in my hand I had a phone, a flashlight, and something else other than a flashlight in case I might need something other than a flashlight, and I began to panic that this moment was escalating to a point I didn't want it to escalate to. He's moving towards me, his hands are waving in the air, he's talking incoherently, and I say, stop right where you're at. And amazingly, he does. And I think, okay, I've got control of this moment. He starts talking again, he starts kind of walking around in a circle, and I say, I'm thinking I've got to hold him here until the police arrive. So I say, sit down on the curb. And he does it. And then something happened. He pulled his knees up close to his chest. He wrapped his arms around his knees. He put his head down and he began to cry. And I could see a phone in his hand and he's crying. And then he says, mom, he can't hear you. And I realize he might be on the phone with his mom. And now I have this softness for him. Things are changing quickly. I once saw him as a imminent threat who was out of control. And now I see him as what seems to be a young adult who's lost and scared. Something's going on. So I cautiously and carefully walk over to him and I say, is that your mom on the phone? And he's just crying and he lifts the phone up and I said, give me the phone. I take the phone and on FaceTime is his mom and she tells me that she's scared and that he went out with some friends he hadn't seen in months and they took him drinking and he got drunk. He doesn't know where he's at. They left him and abandoned him and he's just trying to get home. She said, I've sent two Ubers for him and he won't get in the car with them or they can't find him. And can you please, I'll give you $20, can you please drive him out to Orangevale? Now at this point, I'm still not really sure what's going on and I don't know what kind of person he is and I don't know what kind of threat he is. And I know the police are already on their way and I say, let me call you back in five minutes. We'll try and work something out. I handed him his phone back and I felt compelled to just be there for him. So I actually sat alongside of him and I began to talk to him and ask him questions. And he was clearly drunk and maybe even high. And so his answers were a little difficult to understand. But what I got from him was he was terribly embarrassed and terribly ashamed of where he had gotten himself. He felt betrayed and abandoned by his friends. He was scared and alone and he just wanted to be home. And he called his mom, and I felt the compassion and love of a parent imagining one of my own kids in this moment. 
And so we talked. And I assured him that everything was going to be okay. And I told him that tomorrow he was going to feel better. And I said, we're going to get you home. And I said, you're going to see your mom tonight and you're going to get in your bed and you're going to sleep. And tomorrow you're going to really regret that you did this. Your head's going to hurt. You're going to be sick to your stomach. You're going to have a dry mouth and you're going to feel a lot of regret. And you're going to realize maybe not to hang out with these friends again in the future. And I realized something had happened in that moment that I was not really there anymore to get him in trouble or to get him away from me or to get him... As a matter of fact, I wanted to make sure he stayed safe. And when the police arrived, I made sure to speak first. I didn't want them meeting him with a hostility or an aggressiveness because they thought he might be a threat because that's really the impression I left them. So I said, he's just a kid who's gotten himself a little drunk and he's gotten abandoned by his friends and his mom's trying to get him home and that hasn't been successful. Maybe you guys can help get him there. And by setting that tone, the police actually took on a posture of wanting to help. Now, what I didn't tell you was all during this, this six foot four lanky kid who probably could have choked me out pretty easily had gotten up a couple times while we were sitting on the curb and just comes behind me and wraps his arms around me and cries on me and thanks me. Before I left them, he hugged me again as the police were there and Then we watched through the window. I had brought the police and him some bottled waters, and then we stood back and let them do what they had to do, and he was hugging the police. He was so thankful that somebody took the time to care for him. So you're wondering why I have told that story. It's that sometimes opportunity to serve people comes when we least expect it, when we least want it to happen, when it's most inconvenient, and it's something that we would least choose to engage ourselves in. But it serves someone in a moment when they can't do for themselves. Matthew 20 verse 28 says this, be like the son of man. This is Jesus referring to himself. He did not come to be served. Instead, He came to serve others. He came to give his life as a price for setting many people free. Jesus is saying that serving people doesn't necessarily just meet an immediate practical need, although serving people should always meet an immediate practical need. Serving people is about liberating them from something they're trapped in. In the moment, we're in a season of fear, Struggle, pain, sin, shame, embarrassment, frustration, loneliness, being lost. Serving those, especially those that we don't think might be deserving of being served, tells them that they're worthwhile, that they're valuable. And that's the whole purpose of why Jesus served us with his life, served us with his sacrifice, is to tell us that because of our sin, we feel trapped and lonely and broken because of mistakes in our life or because of things that other people have done to us, we don't feel valuable. We don't feel worthwhile. And Jesus served us to show us that we were worthwhile. He got onto his knees and he washed the feet of his disciples and he said, listen, you're not better than the master. So why wouldn't you do for others what I've done for you? The reality is that God is going to equip you and prepare you for the moment that you need to serve. And those moments will come often because, listen, this scripture encourages us to use our gifts to serve repetitiously. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, God's gifts of grace. Grace is giving what doesn't deserve to be given, what they don't deserve. We give grace Gifts of God's grace come in many forms. Each of you has received a gift in order to serve others. In other words, God has given you a unique gift, not for you. It has nothing to do with you other than you are the giver of God's gift of grace to other people, to serve them. And it says you should use it faithfully, meaning that it's not a gift that wears out. You keep using it over and over and over again. So here's my question to you. What one person will you choose to serve 
tomorrow. What person are you going to forgive and what person are you going to serve? And then third and finally is this, the simplicity of being Jesus starts with choosing one person to love. As you know, Jesus was really good at dismantling long-held belief systems that came from our own minds and our own hearts and some things that came from what we believed were God's heart and instruction in ancient and sacred, sacred scripture. But we have a bunch of people even today, and we definitely had a bunch of people back then that knew scripture but didn't know God himself. And so Jesus loved to take on those concepts. So one of the most dearly held concepts by the religious leaders at that time and therefore by the people of that time was that God was angry and God was vengeful and he was ready to strike people down as soon as they stepped out of line. The moment you are unrighteous, God could not wait to punish you for that. And conversely, the reality was that they believed that God's love was held only for those who were righteous who were well-behaved, who were keepers of Moses' law, who were free of mistakes, failures, missteps, sins, all forms of unrighteousness. That was the economy of love. God gave you love if you were good. God held back his love if you were bad. And so people thought, if that's a good enough economy for God, then it's a good enough economy for me. But Jesus was about to completely disrupt what it looked like to love those who sinned against you, those who were broken, those who were uh, aggressive, those who were failures. Jesus was about to turn all of what they believed about God on its ears. Matthew 5, 44 through 48, or 43 for 48, says this. You've been taught to love your neighbor and kind of hate your enemy. But I tell you this, love your enemies. Pray for those. Not pray against those, not curse those, but pray for those who torment you, who annoy you, who frustrate you, who persecute you. In doing so, you'll become the children of your Father in heaven. This is how to become like Jesus. He, God after all, loves each of us, good and evil, kind and cruel. The Bible says he came to us when we were sinners, not waited for us to not be sinners to then love us. He causes the sun to rise and shine on evil and good alike. He causes the rain to water the fields of the righteous and the fields of the sinner. It's easy to love those who love you. Even a tax collector can love those who love him. And it's easy to greet your friends in order, to, in other words, serve them and welcome them and be kind to them and be generous with them. Even outsiders, those outside the faith, those who don't know God do that, but you are called to something higher. Jesus says, this is what the law says, but I'm telling you, that's not the heart of God. This is the heart of God. He says, you're called to something higher. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And here's what that means, that love responds the same way no matter what the circumstance is or who the purpose person is. Love behaves the same no matter how deep and offensive the sin is or how sinful the sinner is. Love gives as generously and as eagerly and as freely to the undeserving as it does to the deserving. And love listen, this is so important, puts into motion tangible and practical action that blesses and builds up, heals, and helps. And love never expects to get something in return. It's not waiting for a thanks. It's not waiting for a reward. It's not waiting for anything in return. Love just loves because it's love and it can't help itself. And love has no qualifiers or conditions or limits. And Jesus pointed to that as what makes God perfect. He said, God loves you perfectly because you're sinners and you're broken and you offend him constantly. And yet he blesses you and he loves you and he holds nothing back from you. He says he does it for the good and the evil. He blesses the righteous and the unrighteous. And I want you to hear this. He says, this is how you become perfect. Not because you live a life free of mistakes, not because you live a perfectly righteous life, not because you righteous your way 
into perfection, that you good your way into perfection, that you don't do evil into perfection. He says, be perfect by loving people perfectly like God loves you perfectly. And I want you to just choose one person who feels very hard to love and begin to love them like Jesus. And I want you to hear this. If you can practice that perfect love, the love that has no limits or boundaries or limitations or conditions, if you can do it with one, you can do it with anyone. Father, thank you for this moment together in which we become more like you by loving one, by forgiving one, by serving one, so that we can love, serve, and forgive like you. And in that, we become perfect like you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so excited that God is moving in our lives. He's moving in your life. He's moving my life. And it is so important for us to share the stories of what God is doing. So hop onto mysummit.church slash connect and click on my story. Or you can just simply email my story at mysummit.church. Let us know how God has been moving in your life. This is the time in our service when we receive our tithes and offerings and we give back to God from what he's given us. You can hop onto mysummit.church, click give, or right above, just click give, and you can set up a one-time payment or a monthly payment. So let's receive tithes and offerings. God, thank you so much for this time that we have together. I thank you for what you have given us. And I pray right now that as we give back to you, that it's with joyful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. Praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it
guys didn't know it, we have Vertical Student Ministries. This is our ministry for middle schoolers and high schoolers. Make sure you send them there every Sunday night at the community center from 6 to 8 p.m. They're gonna connect with each other and connect with God and have a blast. Okay, well, I'm so glad we got to spend this time together and we'll see you guys again next week. Bye.